Well, good morning, church. Well, I remember when I was a kid, I used to walk more than a mile to elementary school, even when I was a kindergartner. Anybody else had to do that kind of stuff? Parents didn't take you in the car. They just pushed you out the door and said, see you next week. Now, it was kind of interesting when that happened to me. Uh, as I got a little bit older, I got to be about age seven, and there was a kid by the name of Teddy Rubles. He's a 10-year-old guy that used to live around the block, a couple of houses down, and he used to try to beat me up on the way to school just for fun. He's 10, I'm seven, and fortunately for me, I was faster than Teddy. Now, one night around the dinner table, my dad was just, you know, asking me and every, you know, we had five kids in our family asking us how our day went and how did things go at school, and I mentioned that everything was really super cool because I could outrun Teddy Rubles so I never got beat up. My dad said, what? And so anyway, uh, long story short, that night at the dinner table, my dad gave my big brother, Dave, who was eight years older than me, an assignment. And the next day I walked to school, Dave was supposed to follow me from a distance. And sure enough, when I walked by Teddy Rubles' house, good old Teddy was reliable and he took off after me. But by this time, my big brother, Dave, was close behind and he caught up to Teddy. Now, so my brother doesn't get arrested today for what happened 61 years ago. <clears throat> Let's just say that Teddy Rubles never bothered me again. <laughs> Listen, church, I would say that big brothers that fight bullies, you know, for you are great. Huh? Would you agree with that? Yeah, it gets rid of bullies really quick. But you need to know that today in 2023, God Almighty, creator of the universe, will take a stand for us and fight for us too. Yeah, I hope you got that out of our worship season today, out of our worship time together today. God's been fighting for his people since the beginning of time. For example, this last week we talked a little bit about Elisha, how Elisha was a man who walked with God and listened to God. He obeyed God and he honored God and he became a prophet of God. And last week we spoke specifically about one particular moment in time that's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 6 when an enemy came against Elisha and his servant. And his servant cries out to Elisha the prophet. He says, Elisha, we are in serious, serious trouble. And Elisha says to his servant, but those who are with us are greater than those who are with our enemy. But his servant looks out and sees this massive army, tons of people all gathered around. They're absolutely surrounded. He has no idea what Elisha's talking about. And so Elisha prays and he prays over his servant and he says, God, open up his eyes. God answered that prayer, and Elisha's servant had his eyes open, and he saw the army of God that was strategically surrounding their enemy, and it was just mind-blowing. We talked a little bit about that last week, but the essence of what we saw last week is that God took a stand for Elisha, and he fought for him, and he's also equipped his church, you and me, to win battles against our greatest enemies. I'm gonna say that one more time. God has also equipped the church that's you and me to win battles against our greatest enemy. And that's why Paul went on to write to the church at Ephesus what has become our cornerstone scripture for this series. It's found in Ephesians chapter six. If you've got your note sheet or you can look on our screens or look in your Bible, Ephesians six, starting with verse 10. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace." In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now today I just wanna park on and focus on verse 15 of what I just read where Paul specifies that the shoes of your armor must be specifically and appropriately fitted to you in order for you to be able to stand strong in the faith when you are spiritually struggling. Now, all of us have different times when we're spiritually struggling. So I went shopping the other day, and I got some shoes. Here's some shoes, some flip-flops. I got some, uh, let's see what else is in my bag here. Oh, got some of these. Everybody needs some of those. Let's see. A pair of men's dress shoes. Anybody? Size 10 if you need them. Uh, oh, here's, everybody needs a pair of these. 
<laughs> I've got the girls up here going like, hey, it's my favorite sermon. It's about shoes. Here you go. You ever have these things here, reef walkers? They are so important when you're going to go out and you're going to go try to pretend like you know how to snorkel and you don't. Uh, Tony Orozco wants these right now. He's going to go line dancing after church. And the last thing I found was these. Now, out of all these shoes, if you were going to be in the army and you have to think about what a soldier has to do, okay? Soldiers got to march all over the place. They got to march day after day, hour after hour after hour. How many of you would pick these for your soldier shoes? Yeah, how many of you would pick, uh, oh, these? No. Which ones would you pick? Which boots? The hiking boots, right? Now, there is a point to this. You see, the problem is, is, is that the Bible talks about you need to have your f- shoes fitted, your spiritual shoes fitted. The problem is people in the world try all different kinds of shoes to do battle, and they think that it's going to work for them. People try all different kinds of philosophies. They try all different kinds of religions. They have belief in all kinds of other different systems of thought, systems of belief. But there's only one rock that is named Christ Jesus that doesn't get in your shoes. It becomes something that's fitted that you can walk in, give the gospel of peace, and give yourself a chance to be able to stand firm against the enemy. Yeah, you can, don't steal the shoes after the show. They're out of my closet. But anyway, well, my wife in my closet, but anyway. <laughs> Why did I go to the shoes thing? Because in the context of the Roman soldier and his armor that Paul is using as a metaphor, everybody in that day would have known exactly what he was talking about because they understood. They'd seen soldiers' sandals, their, their, their armament. We talked about last week how in the United States Army, our military is so powerful because of the equipment that they have, and it even starts with their clothing. It starts with the kind of boots that they wear. It starts with the kind of socks that they wear. I don't know if you've ever uh, got a pair of military socks uh, I have a pair because there's a friend of mine who's a retired uh, officer in the Air Force, or pardon me, in the Marines, don't ever say Marines. <laughs> and he's on our board of directors, Don Fagan, and, and he goes to, what are the, what's that place they call where you do the shopping if you're on base? What is it, the commissary? Okay, commissary, whatever it's called. I thought that was the kitchen. But anyway, all right, wherever. Anyway, he goes on base and he still buys clothes there and stuff because they're they're not just cheaper for you if you're military, but the quality's insane. And I was out there visiting, he lives in Colorado Springs, and we were gonna go up to his ranch and go hiking and do some, you know, stuff on quads and, and shoot guns and all that kind of stuff that you do when you're in Colorado. And he says, I gotta give you a pair of these socks because you've never had socks unless you've had military socks. And I don't know if you've ever had a pair of those. I have a pair in my drawer. I still keep, I don't, those things you can, you can wear them. You can turn them inside out, wear them on the other side, turn them out on the other side. I mean, they just keep on lasting forever. I haven't washed them in six years. <laughs> just kidding on the washing part. But I'm telling you, they are the thickest socks you'll probably ever wear. And they are so padded that when you've got them inside of your hiking boots, it's like you think you could walk forever because you're like on a cloud. What I'm saying to you is, the fitting of your feet and the, the importance of the foundation you stand on is a big deal to our military troops. And the people understood that that Paul was talking to when they were looking at the, the soldiers that carried the weaponry that were around them. They understood that those soldiers had to march and had to climb on stones. Their, their, their streets were not smooth and paved and cement like ours. They had to walk on jagged terrain in battle. They'd go up mountains and down mountains. They'd have to march for hours every day, it seems like, sometimes through the night. And if they cut their feet or they wounded their feet or they had swollen feet, they were in trouble. And they knew this because for a soldier, your feet are your foundation for battle. And I want you to get that concept out of verse 15 this morning, that what you stand on, your feet are your foundation for battle. And that's what Paul is going after in this text, that your feet are your foundation. He wants you to start thinking about what are you building your life on? What is it that you stand on that gives you a sense of a foundation that is sure? 
Because if you have crummy shoes that allow your feet to be wounded and cut and swollen, then your foundation's unstable. I mean, honestly, what is the power of the rest of your armament, of your helmet, of your breastplate, of your sword, and of your shield? If you're down on the ground and you're unable to get up, you can't stand up because your feet are torn up. You're in trouble if your foundation is in trouble. And so Paul's applying that to us in the spiritual battles that we face in the areas of our mind, in the areas of our emotions, and in the area of our will, in the choices that we make. And what is it that Satan would love to do? He wants you barefooted, if you will, or depending on the wrong type of shoes when he comes to tempt you and to destroy you. And he'd love to have barefooted soldiers that stumble and falls. He wants you so weak in your feet that you can't stand. He wants your feet to be cut and wounded and swollen and unable to wear shoes that can protect you and enable you to use your other spiritual weapons that God has provided for you in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. What Paul is saying to you is that Satan wants you to lose your footing, which is your foundation in faith. Young people, we got a lot of high schoolers. There's a horrible statistic about high schoolers and college students. Those that are Christians that grow up in the church as a Christian in their high school, junior high and high school years, 80% of young people that are in high school as Christians will leave college as a non-believer. And the reason is, is that the foundation wasn't secure. They were wearing these (laughs) instead of these. They had a faith that belonged to their mama, but it didn't become theirs. They had a faith that belonged to their father, but it didn't become theirs. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, he was high, and he was lifted up. And I said, woe am I, for I am a man of unclean lips. Why is it a big deal to Isaiah that, that, that the, the, his, his leader died? It's because that's what brought a sense of security. And now he had to stand on his own two feet. The question is, young people, is can you stand on your own against what your college professors are going to tell you? Can you stand on your, I remember when I went to biology class, and that was like back in 1921. No, it was 73, 74. But I remember in that great big old, you know, science building, you know, it's like 300 people in that classroom, and and how it was assumed that you all believed in the theory of evolution as fact. What I'm saying to you is, is the question is, what is your foundation becomes something that God is talking to us about in Ephesians chapter 6 because he wants you to understand that Satan's game plan is to undo your footing, to destroy your foundation. He wants to do that in your character. He wants you to compromise your convictions and fudge on your job. He wants to do that. He wants you to do that in your marriage. If you are married, he wants you to feel all alone. He wants you to get a divorce. Satan wants to set up schemes, so he will set up schemes and bring people around you that will unravel your relationships in your family and in your business and in your church and with your neighbors because he not only wants to undo your relationships, he also wants to undo your career and your finances. And he has plans and he has schemes and plans to destroy your reputation and your potential for good. And because of that, Paul tells us, you need to take a stand if you're a follower of Christ. And throughout Paul's letters to the many churches that he planted all over the world, he would emphasize that what you stand on is mission critical. So ask yourself, he's saying, what does your life stand on? What's the foundation of your life? Because what Paul alludes to in this passage is that there is nothing more necessary and more powerful and more supreme that you can build your life on than Jesus Christ. And Paul explains why when he writes to the church of Colossae in Colossians 1.15, he talks about who Jesus is. Your worldview will be affected by who you believe Jesus is. I don't know if you see Jesus as King Jesus or if you see him as a religious leader. He's not another religious leader like Confucius. He's not another religious leader like Muhammad. There's not another religious leader who said, you tear down this temple, you kill me, and in three days I'll come back again. And he did it. And so what Paul explains is who Jesus is. 
He says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or authorities or, or rulers, or all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things, everybody say, hold together. If you're coming apart, man, that's so important. If you're feeling like things are coming unglued for you in your life right now, in him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is the pioneer and the captain of our salvation. We follow him because he's already won the battle. We follow him because he's already written the first and the last chapter chapter of the book, and we know that he comes to bring battle against our enemy, and we know at the end of the time that we will see him rise victorious over our enemy, and we will reign with him forevermore. He wrote the first and the last because he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And Paul declares that in God, that's what holds all things together. So that's what we stand on when everything else around us is shaking, when the economy is shaking, when the interest rates are shaking, when Silicon Valley Bank is shaken and it doesn't exist anymore, and Signature Bank is gone and it doesn't exist anymore, and Swiss National, it, when that bank is going down, and you start looking at all the world is getting all concerned, we stand on the knowledge and the confidence and the certainty that all things are not only created by God, but they're held together by God. We don't stand on philosophy. We don't stand on men's skepticism. We don't stand on money as our foundation in life. That's not our God. We don't stand on religion. We don't even stand on ourselves. What we stand on is the will of God that holds things together, not our own will. And that's why we surrender to him because only he can forgive our sins and give us a fresh start in this life when we're in the storms of life. And it's only by God's grace that's given so freely at great expense that you and I even get to be a part of the church, which is a living organism that was a established by Jesus Christ, of which he is the head. And he didn't just stop by creating it. He's given certain gifts, and he's given talents, and he's given abilities to all of us to be a part of the body of Christ and impact this world for good. Aren't you glad that God gave us musicians that could sing, sing and make praises to God on all the different instruments? But aren't you, do you understand that the reason why he gave us them is because you're the choir and he's given you a holy mission to stand up as the army of God and worship as the army of God because he inhabits the praises of his people. That these people don't perform, they simply engage and they give you the avenue with which you can engage and together we can lift up our voices and together we can bring the gifts, the talents, the abilities and even if you can't sing, you can make a joyful noise. So it matters. It matters that we get connected locally together in a local church on a regular basis. That's God's big idea for us, not to forsake the assembling together of ourselves. I don't think it's an accident that when the pandemic hit, one of the tools that the enemy tried to do was to stop us from connecting. Because there's something about that connection that happens when you're face to face when, when you're in the church, cheek to cheek. <laughs> Sorry, just had to throw that in. Ushers came to me last. We had just had to add 50 more seats because we were running out of seats. Too many people were getting, yes. That's God's big idea for us, to get connected. We're not aimlessly doing nothing, just gathering on weekend to, you know, to compare our vacation pictures and posts on the internet. We gather together on purpose for the kingdom of God because eternity is on the line and people matter to God. And what Colossians 1 proclaims is that this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us, he saves us, he bore the cross, he beat the grave. That's what that song sang this morning that we were singing. This is our God, he's King Jesus, who rules supreme over depression and poverty and sickness and brokenness and confusion. So we have peace with God through Jesus who rose from the dead and on the third day, day after that until this time and forevermore he will reign supreme over every power on earth this is important both seen and unseen now that's what we stand on that's the only foundation we stand on Jesus is our firm foundation and by the way if you've never said yes to Jesus even if you're listening to me 
online this morning or in the lobby this morning or wherever you're at listening to me right now, if you've been thinking about becoming a Christian but you've never surrendered your will, I don't know how long you've been thinking about going all in, but I would simply say that if you have never said yes today, today could be your day. Why put it off? Today's the day of salvation. If this is your moment to say yes to God, it's a really big deal. Everybody in this group here today would probably just about everybody here would say it's a really big deal. There have been thousands of people that have been baptized in this church. We just baptized 20 more new followers of Christ just two or three weeks ago. What I'm saying to you is that if you come to God and you say yes to him, you'll find that you will be spiritually reborn. You'll be born again on the inside and you will be reconciled to God you feel like instead of being an enemy of God that he has given you a fresh place to start again. And what Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 is, is that the way that it happens and when that happens is that the first thing you need to do is you need to change your shoes. You need to start walking, stop walking around in high heels. You need to stop walking around those dress shoes. You need to get them army boots on because you're going for a walk with Jesus. You need to get a custom pair that's been custom designed for you by your creator because what you stand on, your foundation is important and it determines if you'll fall flat on your face in your relationships and in life itself. But it's not only what you stand on that is important, but what you stand for. You see, when you have opposition in your life and personal or physical or relationship battles are raging in your life, it really matters what you stand on and what you stand for. So ask yourself this morning, where is it that you need to take a stand? Where is it? When, when God starts to talk to you, and it's amazing to me how I just preach a sermon and, and you guys and the Holy Spirit just finish it. Because people tell me all the time, you know, I said something, I go, I didn't say that. But I said something along that line, and then the Holy Spirit just kind of amplifies it. Hello, does anybody know what I'm talking about here today? And I believe what the Holy Spirit is already starting to tell you this morning is asking you the question, where is it that you need to change what you're standing on for your goals and your dreams? What is it that's most important to you? Is it in your workplace or your family or your gym or your neighborhood or your school? Maybe God has you here today because he wants to remind you that you need to take a stand for Jesus wherever he's placed you wherever he's placed you, somewhere in your life and in this world, this is going to be very important when it comes to what God is building in you because where and how you take a stand is going to matter in your faith journey. For example, if you take a stand in your marriage, that's going to matter. I say that because many of you today perhaps are just like the rest of America and you're thinking that your marriage is kind of unusual compared to the rest of the people that are Christians because Nobody else that's a Christian has struggles in their marriage. Is that true, George? Yvonne, Pastor George, where are you? Is that true? No, Christians don't have struggles in their marriage, is that true? No, 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 no. How many of you would agree that everybody's marriage is struggle at some point? Yeah, I know my wife has struggles in our marriage because she married me. But you get alongside of some of your friends who aren't Christians and they'll whisper and they'll, you know, you tell about all the stories and the hassles you've had at home and they'll just say, hey, why don't you dump them? Why don't you dump her? Divorce is easy. The way out of this is just walk away. You know, maybe the world that keeps teaching us how to flirt and have affairs and all the stuff that's on TVs and in movies, maybe that's how the evil one is whispering into your ear. Listen, folks, life is not merely about solving a problem. Life is about becoming a problem solver. See, it's not you're just gonna have to get past one problem. It's not just about solving a problem because if that's all you got your focus on, you're not ready for life, you know? Perhaps your biggest problem is you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't know, Pastor Bill, I'm a Christian, so I shouldn't have problems. I, I'm born again, saved and baptized, sanctified, and backwards, wrecked, never mind. Can I tell you something? Nobody has a problem free marriage. Everybody has problems with their relationships, whether we're married or single. We have problems in our marriage. We have problems in our parenting. We have problems in our finances. We have problems in our careers. We have problems with our boss. We have problems with our employees. We have problems in our church. People have problems with their pastor. Pastors have problems with people. Let's just all clear it all up. I got problems, you's got problems, all God's children's got problems. 
I mean, let's just clear it all up. How many of you across this campus right now, at least the ones I can see anyway, you could participate too at home or in the lobby? If you have one problem, out in the lobby too, if you have one problem, raise your hand. Everybody has a problem, raise your hand. Look around, everybody. If, now raise it, and keep it up. If you have more than one problem, raise up the other hand. Look at that, both hands raised. Look at her out there, woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. See, we all have problems. Give God a praise. So maybe your problem is you keep thinking you should have a problem-free life. And I just gave you all the statistical empirical data that you're crazy if you believe that. You know, you think you should have a problem-free marriage, so you're not working on the problem in your marriage. And guess who the problem in your marriage probably is? Instead, you're just thinking, how come this thing isn't problem-free? I love Jesus. By the way, divorce is rarely a real solution to the problems in marriage. You know why? Because there's two people it takes to make up a marriage, and when you get divorced, there's still one of them in the problem area. And maybe the thing the Spirit of God is saying is that you've got to take a stand for Christ in your marriage and for your marriage. That didn't get much except for from George, (laughs) head of our marriage ministry. He's saying they have no idea how much this divorce is going to cost them. If you invested as much money and time into saving your marriage as it's going to cost you in your divorce, you'd say that was a better deal to stay married in Jesus. You see, there are right things to do in work. There's right things to do in business. There's right things to do in the area of your faith. There's right things to do in life. And you have to ask yourself, is God whispering some things to you and reminding you where you need to take a stand in your character? Maybe you need to take a stand in your finances because you see all kinds of other people around you and you know they're just abusing debt just to be able to get whatever it is that they want. But you're trying to stay in a budget and be financially responsible while everything in you just wants to blow the budget and indulge in a vacation that you can't afford and buy a new car that you can't afford that smells new and gets 200 miles per gallon so you can afford to go buy season tickets for the 49ers, Sharks, and Warriors and drive all your friends to all those new games. And God's saying, stop. Take a stand. Honor God. Honor your budget. Stop. Stop what you're doing. Win long-haul financial games. Get that long-haul financial freedom, God is saying. Get in the right game. Ask yourself, God is saying, where is it that you're trying to sit on the fence And God wants to inspire you to take a stand and either be hot or cold. Are there areas of compromise in your life that need to be addressed today? Just remember what we talked about last week and at the beginning of this message that God took a stand for Elisha and he fought for him in response to Elisha's faith and faithfulness. He also will take a stand for you. How do I know that? Because even before you become a Christian, God took a stand for you when he sent Jesus, his son, to come into this world to be the visible image of the invisible God so that we could see the love of God freely expressed in human flesh as he shed his blood, as he would rise from the dead so that you could be reconciled to God. He took a stand for you when he asked his son, Jesus, to leave a position of majesty in heaven and to be born as a baby in Bethlehem and then to be abused and to be tortured and crucified on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. And then Jesus didn't stop there. He fought for you to be able to show you the way to freedom and a purpose-driven life. So you ask me, why is God fighting for you? It's because he knows that there is an unseen enemy that's seeking to destroy you. So it makes perfect sense that there will be no spiritual victory is one without taking a stand for what is right and holy and pure. God tells us in the word, without holiness, no person will see God. You have to walk in holiness. Holiness doesn't mean that you're better than anybody else. I told you last week that it comes from that word hagios. To be holy means to be set apart, to be a saint. It means, that's why we called it the saints young adults group. Because they're people of destiny. They're not better than anybody else. They just, they, they, they just know whose they are. They know that they've been set apart for something that's special. The reason why you don't eat bugs is because God's got a steak and lobster waiting for you in Jesus' name. And if you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry. No, I'm the, he probably has a salad for you too. Yeah. You like the salad part, yeah. 
That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 6.13 to stand your ground. But then you jump down to verse 18, Paul just tells us how to do that. And he gives us two words. He says, and pray. He says, pray. And Pastor Lily says, pray more. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 18. Look at how many times it says to pray. See if this guy's a little bit obsessed with prayer. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. In other words, Paul is requesting his friends to help him to bring other people to Christ. How are they supposed to help him? Pray, 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 pray. And how is Paul telling them to keep praying? Why is he telling them to do that? He's saying, well, guys, when you pray is when you get your devil-stomping, habit-breaking, liberty-claiming boots on. Start wearing these suckers. That's how you start get stomping on the devil's head. You stomp on your devil's head, you gotta have really good aim to do any good with this little thing. <laughs> you step on the devil's head with this and he's gonna go, what was that? You step on that sucker with this thing and boy, he's, you got his attention. This is called pray, 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 pray. Don't worry about it. Some of you obsessive compulsive people are wondering if I'll pick those up before the end of the sermon. <laughs> I did that just to mess with you. You're gonna stay awake the rest of the whole sermon to see if I pick those up. So the first big idea is to take a stand. Second big idea is to take more ground. I love this one. Yesterday, I'm a proud grandparent. You know, I've, you know we, went, we had a granddaughter, a little uh, seven-year-old granddaughter playing in a basketball tournament. She scored points yesterday, and her team won, and she scored some baskets and stuff, so that was really cool. We got the videos and stuff from that, and I went to two games yesterday for three grandsons because two of them were on the same team. And uh, in the first game that my, how old is Clint, dear? Seven? Six? Six. He's six. He's six years old. So all he's six years old playing baseball. That's always interesting to see if after they hit the ball, they'll go to third or first first. But anyway, this isn't T-ball. This is, they got to hit a pitch. And dude went three for four, six years old. Three for four. He got the game ball, and he scored two runs, and they won. That's Clint, all right? Then Baxter and Milo are played. They're in the majors. Milo's only nine. He's playing in majors. That's not usually allowed, but he's that good. Just no brag, just fact. So anyway, <laughs> they're both playing in the majors. Opening day was yesterday, Little League for the majors, and I'm, I appreciate the other team, but the game got called when my grandson's team was ahead by over 10 runs in the fourth inning. No brag, just fact, they're good ball players. <laughs> you know what I like about that? When they got ahead, they didn't say, we're ahead by enough. They said, there's still more ground to take. I want a bat. And I, and I heard that little discussion afterwards that the coach was making with the kids afterwards, after the game. Said, you guys, what'd you guys think of the game? And the guy that was the next guy up, the guy that was supposed to come up to bat next, happened to be my grandson, Milo. And he says, you have any, any, any comments about the game? He says, yeah, why'd they stop it? I was up next. <laughs> he wanted to take more ground. You know, the problem is a lot of Christians, we think it's okay just to get in church. And God has some more ground for you to take in your family and in your business and in your community and in your personal life because unless Jesus is Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I'll say it this way. God does not want you to be satisfied with the status quo. And that's why he provides us with tools that restore the damage from sin in our lives. And that is a process. Everybody say process. The process of taking more ground is the basis for the theological concept of sanctification. I know it's a big theological sounding word, but it's an important one. Sanctification simply means being set apart by God to live for God. And it involves a never-ending process of putting off the, your old way of life by putting on God's new way of life that Jesus teaches us to live by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. 
When you become born again, something called eternal life comes into your soul. You become something that becomes alive then to the voice of God. And now you'll start to hear options that start getting presented to your mind that you were deaf to before because you were not tuned into them before because you couldn't hear the voice of God because you were ignoring God. But when you say yes to Jesus, you know, the question isn't whether or not God is speaking to you. The question is whether or not you're tuned in and whether or not you're listening to him. That's why the Bible says that the thief comes to rob to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly and to defeat the works of the enemy in your life. And sanctification is something that tells us that it is a process that starts from the day that you become born again, but it doesn't stop until you get to be like Jesus. You, and that means to be with him, to literally die, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Now, the seminary way of expressing that glorious truth of sanctification, you could say it this way, if you wanted a succinct statement. You could say, sanctification is an absolute and a continuing work of grace. It's something that absolutely sets you apart. The day that you're born again, you belong to God. You are a saint. You're chosen by God in that moment. You're set apart. But it's also something that you could continue to work the God's grace in your life. He'll work it in your life, and you'll keep on putting off the old man and putting on the new man in new ways. So that's the way to say it if you're going to seminary. Sanctification is an absolute and a progressive work of grace, a continuing work of grace. There's a street lingo vernacular way to say it too. It simply goes like this. God saves you completely the moment you say yes and loves you too much to leave you the way that you started out on your journey of faith. And he wants you to experience victory after victory as you continue the process of putting off your old ways of life and putting on the new ways of life that are inspired by the spirit of God within you. So stop accepting the status quo. God has better plans for you than where you are right now. Now, I want you to notice something. Paul never tells us, when he says, pray, 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 he never tells us to pray that we would, you know, get an easy life. Paul never says, pray for easy. I love the dude, man. He's always saying, take more ground, dude. We need to take more ground. You know why? Because the devil's gonna come back and he's gonna try to get more. And the further all you are with Jesus, the easier it is gonna beat him up because you're, you're, you're practiced now and wearing these stomping things here. You're gonna need to get those shoes on. And Paul says to pray for him that he might take more ground for the kingdom. Pray for me that I'll do that, Paul says. Look, everything is not going to be perfect and honky-dory just because you prayed. I don't know who told you that stuff. Prayer changes things. And and progress is a wonderful thing when things change. And, And I know it's true that you win enough battles, eventually you win the war. So that's what Paul is doing here. He's saying that the way that we win the battle over the enemy is battle after battle after battle, victory after victory. You might lose a few, but the devil will pay for what he does for messing with you. So when you have a battle in your life, don't give up and think God's not around anymore. Paul says instead, pray for me, pray for each other. And we say, well, why should we pray for you, Paul? Why is that important? And he says, because don't you guys understand? We're in a spiritual war because it's bigger than you can see physically and materially because the big battle and the real world battle is the world that's in the realm of the spirit. And what's happening in the spiritual world, you can't see with your physical eye. You think when you go to high school, it's all about whether or not you have the right clothes on or you're in the right social media channels or you got Snapchat working for you and all that stuff. And that's not the real world. That is such a material world. It's going to be gone tomorrow. You'll be in college, then someday you'll be married, and you're going to be in charge and go like, why did I make all those decisions that I made? What Paul is saying to us is is that prayer is how you engage in the world, in the realm of the spirit that gets remedy and results and healing in this world that give you life ever, ever more, and it builds something for your future that you don't have to be afraid of. The problem is, is that when we only work in our confidence in things that are material, the problem is things that are material will fail you. Things that are in social media will not sustain you. Things that are the opinions of man will let you down, but the world of the Lord, it lives forever, and if you build your life upon that rock, it will stand firm in the storm, and you'll be okay when everybody else, their heart is failing them for fear. 
But Paul says, remember what's happening in the spiritual world. You can't see it with your physical eye, but prayer is how you engage in that world and get remedy and results and healing. And it's only God that can move mountains, but prayer and faith move God. Prayer is what moves God, it moves his heart, and that's why God invites us to pray. And so Paul says, I'm not praying or asking you to pray for me that I would have a problem-free life. I'm not praying that you would ask God to make my life easy. I'm just asking that you would pray for me so that I would get my spiritual boots on and fearlessly take more, more ground for the kingdom of God and pray for me that I would do this fearlessly because I know that we're in a revolution. The question for you today is, have you settled for where you are spiritually or are you determined to take more ground for God? Your answer to that question is what's really gonna hang in the balance. Are you, gonna, are you gonna really, really, really care enough to share the things that you've got with other people because everybody else has the same need that you have? There was a recent survey that was taken, I just saw this this last week on the internet, that says 57% of Americans think at least monthly about how they can find more meaning and purpose. Your friends that don't go to church still wish they had meaning and purpose. And there was a recent survey by George Barna that showed that 18% of unchurched people get interested in attending a local church if they just see something about that church in social media. And I got excited about that until I read the next paragraph. What got really exciting to me that I thought was really awesome is that 47% of people get interested in attending a local church if a friend of theirs invites them to attend their church with them. They might not even believe there's a God, but yet they know that there's something that's missing in their life, and maybe that's you this morning. Maybe they don't understand that the battle isn't against flesh and blood, but there's spiritual things that are unseen that are coming against them. But you are a carrier of the gospel that God sends you out to be an ambassador of his, a spokesman for him to bring hope to those. And especially for you as we start getting ready for Easter at FCC. I want you to start asking yourself, who is near me that is far from God? Because I hope that you start to shift your focus, especially now in these next few weeks as we come up to our holiest holiday of the year where we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. That you understand that God has strategically placed you on a heavenly map with the mission. And those people that you're around in your schools, in your jobs, your neighborhood, in your family, your friendships, They've been placed there by God and he's allowed them to cross your path. And I pray that you would fearlessly bring them into your relationships, maybe even a friendship by being nice to them, that you could invite them into a conversation that could somehow lead you to inviting them to one of our two Easter services at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. We're gonna have a second service on Easter Sunday because we're barely fitting now as it is right now. And we expect you to bring hundreds with you this Easter. Can I get a witness? And that's why Paul says to pray. And I start thinking about the importance of taking a stand. And will the world notice? I just close with this story. Tuesday, uh, last Tuesday night after I, we got done with work and we left the office early, we drove up to Sacramento. Melody and I did for my birthday. She got tickets for us to see Carrie Underwood. And we were at the uh, Golden One Arena and about 20,000 people packed out. Totally packed out show. And I watched as she sang, you know, the crowd, they're a bunch of fans. They don't, you don't pay that kind of money to go to a show unless you like the person that's singing. So they were, you know, she was preaching to the choir whenever she sang, but she's very bold in her faith, very upfront about who Jesus is to her. She prays with her team every night before they go on stage. And many comments about who Jesus is to her throughout the, sta throughout the show. And she sings songs, all different kinds of styles until she got to this one song that she was singing towards the end of her show. It was a song that's very famous. It's called Jesus Take the Wheel. I thought the place was gonna go nuts. Everybody was hooting and hollering. They thought that was like the favorite song of the night was Jesus Take the Wheel. And as she comes to the end of that, Jesus Take the Wheel, and then she segues right into, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. It was nuts. It was like the roof lifted off the place. It was like the national anthem was getting played and everybody's on their feet and everybody's like, yeah, then sings my soul. And when she got done, there was such a roar in that place. Favorite song of the night, everybody, hands down. 
was then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. I thought, wow. And I don't know if you realize, we kind of snuck one in you on you this morning. After the end of that worship set that the worship team did, they snuck a new one in on you. It's called This Is Our God because we're getting ready for Easter. And what we celebrate as a church, that we serve a resurrection Savior, that he gave us the equipment to win the battle with. And you can, you can stand firm in your faith and you can grow in your faith. There's hope for you. And so that song, This Is Our God, our worship team, I'm gonna have them sing it again. That's how we're gonna close out this service. But I want you to sing it kind of like Carrie Underwood's crowd did. I don't want anybody leaving running potty yet. You got five more minutes for that. I want you to catch this song because we've got a couple more things to tell you. But I want you to let this song permeate your heart so that this, I, I believe this is gonna be kind of like another national anthem. This song just came out two or three months ago. It's a brand new song. Phil Wickham wrote it. And if you know, you saw the song Jesus Revolution, the movie Jesus Revolution, Phil Wickham was a worship pastor for many years for Craig Glory, Greg Glory. So that's where Phil Wickham comes from. This song, when he wrote it, it just came out of a session and it goes like, wow. Everybody's just like, this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. And, and I just like, wow. When I heard it, I was up at my daughter and son-in-law's house and my son-in-law brings us to me. He says, man, I just heard this new song the other day. He says, this is incredible. He says, you gotta hear this, Bill. He didn't call me dad, didn't call me pastor. He just you gotta hear this, Bill. He plays, he turns on his phone. He says, and I go, whoa. So I sent the link to DK and I said, hey, could we do that in a couple of weeks? And um, they go, yeah, we can. So I appreciate our worship team. Do you appreciate our worship team? But remember, <laughs> their job is not to perform for you. Their job is to help you usher in heaven as we salute our God today. So let's sing the national anthem, if you will, to Jesus. This is our God. This is our God. Let's sing it together.